My name is Philip Rosenfeld. I'm a retina specialist, full professor, Department of Ophthalmology at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. My background is in molecular biology and genetics. I'm a retina specialist, and my specialty has always been macular degeneration. I've been involved in treatments for macular degeneration since 1996. In 2000, I was approached by Genentech to get involved in their phase one program, looking at Lucentis for wet macular degeneration. So back in 2000, when we started working with the early version of Lucentis, we were impressed by the apparent efficacy of the drug. And we started in the phase two program followed by the phase three program. During this time, we were able to use a technology called optical coherence tomography. It allowed us to image the back of the eye and it became clear that the drug was effective. We just didn't know if it was safe and if it could be used for the long term, a year or more. At that time, I started looking into where this molecule came from and it became clear that Lucentis and Avastin were essentially the same molecule. Avastin was derived from a mouse monoclonal antibody, and this was developed by Genentech in the 1990s. While I was doing my residency, this mouse antibody was actually injected into monkey eyes at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, and it was shown to be quite effective in blocking the growth of abnormal blood vessels. Genentech then developed this mouse antibody for cancer therapy, and that's where Avastin came from. It's a humanized mouse antibody. Using my molecular biology background, I started, started to dig into the literature. And what I found was that Lucentis was derived from the same clones that Avastin was derived from. So both molecules, Avastin and Lucentis, would bind VEGF. VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. This is what causes the abnormal blood vessels to grow in cancer and in wet macular degeneration. So both Avastin and Lucentis would bind this molecule, inhibit this molecule, and stop the blood vessels from growing. So it seemed pretty obvious to me that if Lucentis was working, and it clearly looked like Lucentis was working based on our imaging studies and the response that we were observing in patients with improved visual acuity, if Lucentis was working, then Avastin should work. Now, Lucentis, is injected directly into the eye. Back when we started doing this in 2000, we really didn't think patients would tolerate a needle getting stuck in their eye once a month. And that was one of the reasons why we were looking for other ways of delivering a drug like Lucentis to the body. What was attractive about Avastin is it could be infused systemically, an intravenous infusion and you could treat the eye disease without having to stick a needle in the eye. So I approached Genentech with the idea of using Avastin once it got approved for cancer. They weren't particularly interested in applying their cancer drug for ophthalmology. So once Avastin was approved, we pursued our own study funded by grateful patients, approved by our institutional review board, looking at systemic therapy with Avastin for wet macular degeneration. And we treated 18 patients and we followed them for six months. And with just two or three systemic infusions of Avastin, the results were spectacular. The patients did really well and they were delighted, we were delighted. Clearly Avastin had the same effect on the back of the eye as Lucentis did. However, Lucentis was injected into the eye and Avastin was given as a systemic infusion. What was really nice about a systemic infusion was that if patients had disease in both eyes, and that's very common where you have wet macular degeneration in both eyes, a single infusion of the drug systemically would be able to treat both eyes. So one of the reasons why we elected to start injecting Avastin into the eye is it's a much smaller dose, about a 500-fold lower dose, and the idea would be a much lower dose would dramatically decrease the risk of any adverse events. So the question is whether it's safe to inject the drug into the eye and whether it's legal to inject the drug into the eye. And I'm pleased to tell you that 
not only ophthalmology, but many other medical specialties have a long tradition of using drugs off-label. As long as a pharmacy follows what are known as USP guidelines, that's U.S. Pharmacopeia Guidelines, Chapter 797 Procedures for Preparing and Dispensing Sterile Drugs, as long as a pharmacy follows those guidelines strictly, there is absolutely no legal limitation to preparing a drug off-label and injecting it into the eye. We injected the first patients in May of 2005. We presented the data at the international meeting in Montreal in 2005, July. We published our two papers in 2005. In 2006, there were close to 100 papers published. In 2007, close to 200. 2008, close to 250. And so far this year, we're on pace for over 300 papers to be published internationally on the use of intravitreal Avastin for the treatment of not only wet macular degeneration, but diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusion, retinopathy of prematurity, and a full range of diseases that cause blindness that can be treated with this drug. One of the reasons why Avastin gained such popularity is that Lucentis was not yet available. Lucentis was FDA approved the end of June 2006. And during 2006, 2007, Lucentis was competing directly with Avastin, both drugs, products of Genentech. In October of 2007, Genentech announced that they were going to block the sale of Avastin for use in the eye. This created quite an outrage in the ophthalmic community. During our annual meeting in 2007, Susan Desmond Hellman came to our American Academy of Ophthalmology and presented their rationale for blocking the use of Avastin in the eye. At that time, they claimed it was motivated by the Food and Drug Administration, who had audited Genentech's production facilities and directly complained to Genentech that the drug was not being manufactured according to specifications for intraocular injection. Moreover, they claimed the FDA forced them to destroy over $10 million worth of drug because it did not meet specifications for an injection into the eye. She presented this to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and we were quite skeptical. We were skeptical because the FDA went on record stating that as long as the drug was prepared sterilely according to Chapter 797 guidelines, they had no objection to the off-label use of Avastin in the eye. And they disagreed with what Genentech claimed happened, and they claimed they did not require the specifications for intraocular injection. There was much turmoil, needless to say, and a compromise was reached in which Genentech refused to sell Avastin to compounding pharmacies that were preparing the Avastin for intravitreal injection. Rather, Genentech said they would only sell Avastin directly to physicians, and it was up to the physician to arrange for the drug to be compounded so they could use it in patients. To the best of my knowledge, in the United States, this is the only case of an FDA-approved drug that a pharmacy cannot purchase. And it's clear the only reason this restriction is in place is that Genentech does not want Avastin to compete with Lucentis.